Welcome to Cross Point Baptist Church. It's great to have everyone here with us today. And uh, to start off our service, uh, Sally Mitchell is going to go ahead and play Amazing Grace and How Great Thou Art. So just kind of sing along or follow along as you see it up there on the board. Sally, that's beautiful. I love piano music, so I was really enjoying that. And uh, he played wonderfully. Thank you very much for doing that for us this morning. On this resurrection morning, as we celebrate the resurrection of the Lord Jesus Christ, he is risen. He's not in the tomb. That tomb is empty. And we praise the Lord to be able to be here this morning. I do want to start the service off with a word of prayer and ask the Lord to watch over us. Of course, a lot is transpiring here in our nation and here in our state uh, during this time. Uh, I wish I miss uh, everybody getting together and as a church being able to fellowship together. Uh, but I also know that you're praying for the church. You're praying for others. Pray that we will be the witnesses that we need to be in the midst of this uh, dark time. And so I just really hope and pray that as a church that we influence our society for good. And that we're good citizens as well as good Christians as we can possibly be. 
So I want to go to the Lord in a word of prayer today, and we'll ask the Lord to watch over the service, be with our president, be with the Congress, be with others that are making decisions, doctors and nurses that are on the front lines of this, uh, this uh, invisible war, as it's been called. And let's just go to the Lord in prayer, ask him to watch over the service as well. Our Heavenly Father, I thank you, Lord, for today. I do thank you for the goodness it is to be in your house today, Lord, to be able to be together, Lord, with our brothers and sisters in Christ. And Lord, as the Vice President said yesterday, or Friday, Lord, that it's uh, where two or more are gathered together, there am I in the midst. Lord, we know you're meeting with us today. The church is not the brick and mortar and wood of the building itself. Lord, the church is the people. And while we cannot congregate together because of this crisis, because of the laws of our land, Lord, we do also recognize, Lord, that we are meeting together as brothers and sisters in Christ with a unity of spirit and unity of mind and one accord, Lord, wanting to praise you and thank you for that which you've done in our lives. So, Lord, we come before you, Lord, with a humble heart, recognizing on this resurrection day that we have so much to be thankful for. The country we live in, the families you've given to us, the livelihoods that we have. Lord, you've been so wonderful. Father, I pray that you would watch over us today, Lord, but also be all with our nation, Lord, those that are struggling, those in our reserves, National, uh, uh, national Army, Navy, and Marines, others that are serving in other parts of the world. May you watch over them, be with their families today. Be with our president and our vice president, Lord. May you keep them safe, Lord. May you draw them close to yourself, Lord, and help them to make decisions that are the best for us as a nation as well as us as Christians. Lord, I pray that you would also uh, be with the doctors and nurses that are helping to give advice through this. Lord, may you give them wisdom on what's the best uh, time frame for things to begin to open back up. Father, I do also you pre be with the doctors and nurses and uh, orderlies, others that are giving care in the hospitals and clinics around this nation and around the world. Father, I pray that you would protect them, Lord, keep them safe, Lord, help them that they would... Uh, do everything in their power, Lord, to uh, stay healthy. And Father, I pray that you protect them and protect their families as well. Lord, we love you. We're so grateful and thankful for being here today on this resurrection day. Lord, may we lift your name up on high through song. And Lord, may your name be praised in the message that is to come as well. Thank you for all that you've done for us. Bless this time that we have together. Speak to our hearts. And if there be one today that does not know you as Savior, may today be the day of their salvation. Watch over us now. In thy precious Son's name we pray. Amen.
wasn't there to see Good singing this morning. With uh, enjoyed that special, and uh, truly we serve once again uh, the the Lamb of God, and uh, there did rise a Lamb, and praise the Lord for that. We're going to go ahead and sing a couple congregational songs throughout the service, and so we're going to sing uh, right now because He lives. Very great, uh, wonderful old song. Sing along with us there in your home or wherever you happen to be watching us from.
song to be reminded of he does live and everything we face in this world is better because of the lord jesus christ this time i asked my family to come up and sing with me and a song that we love to sing entitled in christ alone and we're gonna sing this acapella for you if we get this right but great song listen to the message of the song uh, as we sing together In Christ alone, my hope is found. He is my light, my strength, my song. This cornerstone, this solid ground, firm through the fiercest drought and storm. What heights of love, what depths of peace, when fears are stilled, when striving cease. My comforter, my all in all, here in the love of Christ I stand. In Christ in alone, Christ alone to God flesh, fullness of God in helpless babe. This gift, this of, gift love of love and righteousness, righteousness, scorned by the ones he came to save. Till on that cross, says Jesus died, the wrath of God was satisfied. For every, For every sin, sin on him was laid, here in the death of Christ I live. There in the ground his body lay, light of the world by darkness slain. Then bursting, then bursting forth in glorious day, up from the grave he rose again. And as he says in victory, since curse has lost its grip on me, for I am his and he is mine, bought with the precious blood of Christ. No guilt in life, no fear in death. This is the power of Christ in me. From life's first cry to final breath, Jesus commands my destiny. No power of hell, no scheme of man can ever pluck me from his hand. Till he returns or calls me home, here in the power of Christ I'll stand. In Christ alone, in Christ alone, in Christ alone. Thank you, family. Appreciate you singing that with us. And we're going to sing another congregational song. And uh, this will be the last one we'll do. And then we'll have one more special. And then we will have time for the preaching of the Word of God. Hopefully all the music is preparing you for that point uh, when the Word of God is preached. That our hearts are prepared for the message that's found there. And that's really the purpose of music. And so I encourage you to just be thinking of this as we sing this next song. Oh, praise His name.
a tree. His body bound and drenched in tears, they laid him down in Joseph's tomb. The entrance sealed by heavy stone, Messiah still and all alone. Beautiful song. Thank you. All those that were singing at, uh, live a uh, long way at home, appreciate that. Hopefully your family appreciated it as well. Uh, but I'm going to ask my wife to come, and she's going to sit, uh, stand actually and sing with me. And my uh, son uh, Theron, just a moment, is going to come and uh, play a song with us. Well, then came the morning, and I think of what it must have been like for the disciples and for Mary and the, the other women that, that followed uh, and took care of Jesus and the disciples, what it must have been like to see him crucified. And Jesus had told them repeatedly he was going to, he was going to be crucified. They were going to take him to uh, take him in Jerusalem. And the very crowds of people that were crying out Hosanna uh, would be the same ones that would now cry out, crucify him, crucify him. And so it had to be a very confusing time for them that they didn't understand everything that was taking place. Of course, we have the ability to look in hindsight uh, to know that it was all part of God's plan and Jesus must needs 
go to Jerusalem. He needed to do this. Uh, that that was essential for the salvation to be brought to mankind. And so as we sing this song, this last song, and then we go into the message, just kind of stop and think about what salvation means and what the death and burial and as we celebrate today the resurrection of Jesus Christ what that means to us as Christians so saying then came the morning they all walked away with nothing to say they just lost their dearest friend all he Said, now he was dead, so this was the way it would end. The dreams they had dreamed were not what they seemed. Now that he was dead and gone, the guard in the jail, the hammer, the nail. How could a night be? so long then came the morning night turned into day the stone was rolled away hope rose with the dawn then came the morning shadows vanished before the sun, death had lost and life had won, for morning had come. The angel, the star, the kings from afar, the wedding, the water, the wine. Now it was done, they taken her son. Wasted before his time She knew it was true She'd watched him die too She'd heard them call him just a man But deep in her heart She knew from the start Somehow her son would live again Then came the morning, night turned into day, the stone was rolled away, hope rose with the dawn, then came the morning, shadows vanished before the sun, death had lost and life had won, or morning had gone, death had lost, and life had won, or morning had gone. Love that song. Great reminder of the fact that no matter what it may have looked like, to the apostles, Jesus Christ knew in three days he was coming up out of the grave. Death could not hold him. He was not bound by the conventions that you and I have to deal with. And truly, he is the son of God. And so I want to just take just a few minutes this morning. And I do mean a few minutes this morning. We've had a lot of other special music. Hopefully you've enjoyed that. Uh, but I want to talk a little bit here about Easter and Resurrection Day, Resurrection Sunday and what that means to us as Christians, and what lessons we can learn from the book of Mark, chapter 16, if you'll take your Bibles. Mark, chapter 16, we'll look at the first eight verses in this. I'm not going to have you turn to read them. I'm going to read them just to you, and then we'll go through each one of these as we go, uh, looking at different verses. Last week, of course, we celebrated Palm Sunday, and uh, there was a Palm Sunday years ago that took place, and there was a little girl by the name of Annie who was five years old, and she couldn't go to church on Palm Sunday because of a sore throat, so she stayed home with her mother. When the rest of the family returned home, they were carrying these palm fronds or palm, palm branches, and Annie asked them, what are, what are those for? 
Well, her dad explained to her, he said, people held them over Jesus as he rode by on a coat, on a, on a horse, a donkey. And she cried out, the little five-year-old cried out, wouldn't you know it, the one Sunday that I'm sick and Jesus shows up and gives pony rides. She misunderstood what, what, the, what her father was trying to say about uh, Palm Sunday. And I'm convinced there are many today that miss out on the meaning of Resurrection Day or Easter because it's been commercialized or because they view it as time off or a special holiday where they get together with family and friends, and never realizing what an important and awesome day it is for us as Christians to be reminded and for the rest of the world to know that he is not dead, he is risen. He is risen. If you're watching us on Facebook or on YouTube, you can go to the church's website and you can download a printable copy of the lesson for today, the message for today, or you can follow along with it uh, there on YouTube or uh, on Facebook. And so I'd encourage you to do that if you'd like, or just kind of sit back and listen and let the word of God speak to your heart. I'm going to read the first eight verses here that's not on our screen, just I'm going to read them to us so that we kind of get some background here. Of course, this takes place after the crucifixion. Jesus Christ has been laid in a tomb for three days and three nights. The Bible records when the Sabbath was passed, Mary Magdalene and Mary, the mother of James, and Salome had brought sweet spices. They might come and anoint him. And very early in the morning, on the first day of the week, they came unto the sepulcher, unto the rising of the sun. And they said among themselves, Who shall roll away the stone from the door of the sepulcher? And when they looked, they saw that the stone was rolled away, for it was very great. And entering into the sepulcher, they saw a young man sitting on the right side, clothed in a long white garment, and they were affrighted. And he said to them, Be not affrighted, ye seek Jesus of Nazareth, which was crucified. Notice this next part here. He is risen. He is risen. He is not here. Behold the place where they laid him. But go your way. Tell his disciples and Peter that he goeth before you into Galilee. There ye sh ye shall ye see him as he said unto you. And they went out quickly and fled from the sepulcher. For they trembled and were amazed. Neither said they anything to any man. For they were afraid. On this first Easter morning or, or resurrection morning, as we call it as Christians. There are basically three groups of people that you find here. And I'm not going to dwell on these because that's really not our point of our message. But there are three groups of people that are here at the resurrection day, that first resurrection day. And I believe those people are still with us today. You find, first of all, those who are believers. Those that are believers. Now, this would be Mary Magdalene. You say, what do you mean? Verses 9 and 10 says, Now when Jesus had risen early on the first day of the week, he appeared first to Mary Magdalene, out of whom he cast seven devils. And she went and told them that she that, that had been with him as they mourned and wept. She was excited. She was amazed. And, of course, Jesus came to her and asked her why she was weeping. And she said, They've taken the body of, of, of my Savior, my Lord, away. Tell me where you put the body, and I'll go get him and bury him. And Jesus, of course, said, said to her, Mary, and she recognized instantly who that was and said, Rabboni, or Master, and uh, Lord. And she recognized and she readily accepted the fact that Jesus Christ had risen from the dead. She didn't doubt her eyes. But number two, you also have the, wan the wanderers. The wanderers, or the, you know, if I'd say people who are kind of in between. You find them in verses 7 and 8 when uh, the um, angel, of course, here, the witness, had told the women to go. It says, go your way and tell his disciples and Peter that he goeth before you into the galley. There shall ye see him as he said unto you. Now, that's a pretty positive thing, very dynamic thing. But yet, what does they say? They went out quickly and fled from the sepulcher, for they were trembled and were amazed. Neither said they anything to any man, for they were afraid. So this is that second group of people. They're, they're wondering, how could this possibly be? They're questioning these things, and they're afraid to simply embrace it as Mary Magdalene did. But then number three, you have the doubters. The doubters, the people that they're like, yeah, I know, they're the skeptics. They're the people that look at it and go, I'm just not sure this, is, this could possibly ever be. They're the ones that they're smarter than God. They're stronger than God. They know more. And rather than simply taking God at his word, they begin to try to rationalize what the words mean. We find them in verses 1 and in verse number 13. It says, And they, when they had heard that he was alive and had been seen of her, believed 
not. Verse 13 says, And they went and told it unto the residue, neither believed they them. The people just flat out said no. Now, of course, we can look at that as one individual person. Of course, most of us know, most of us know him as a man by the name of Doubting Thomas. Thomas was one of the 12 disciples, or 11 now. And uh, he said what? What did Thomas say? He said, unless I'm able to put my fingers into the palm uh, nail prints in his hand and thrust my fist into his side, I will not believe. He was hardcore. The doubters. But I'd like this morning, rather than focusing on the, the wondering or the, the skeptics, I'd like us to focus on that first group this morning, that first group that we talked about, the believers. The believers. Let's look at them right here as we go through this. Number one here. Number one, let's notice that they came expecting a dead body. They came. Now, Jesus had told them repeatedly. He said, I'm going to go to Jerusalem. They're going to try me and kill me, and I'll lay in the grave for three days and rise again. Now, you'd think that when it happened exactly as Jesus said, they would be eager to be there. All of them would have been there on that, that resurrection morning. All of them would have said, you know what, this is where we need to be because Jesus promised that he's going to rise from the dead. It shows their lack of true faith and understanding that Jesus Christ was more than just a great teacher. He was more than just somebody special. He was truly the son of God. And so when he said something, it would come to pass. For three and a half years, they'd watch Jesus do just that. Every time he tried to heal someone, it happened. Every time he cursed something, such as the fig trees and other different things that didn't bear fruit, they withered and died. So you think that why wouldn't they believe? Because this was an extraordinary leap of faith for them to believe that somebody who is dead would come back to life, something that we had never seen. Benjamin Franklin penned his own epitaph years ago. Now, Benjamin Franklin didn't profess to be a Christian, uh, but he seems to be an influence. And you find that throughout his find that throughout his, his writings and his speeches that he gave. And he was influenced by the teaching of Paul concerning the resurrection of the body. Here's what he wrote for his epitaph. He said, the body of B. Franklin, printer, like the cover of an old book, its contents tore out. And stripped of its lettering and gilding, lies here food for worms. But the work shall not be wholly lost, for it will, as he believed, appear once more in a new and more perfect edition Corrected and amended by the author. I thought that was neat when I was looking at this and thinking about Ben Franklin looking at his death. John Quincy Adams, of course, was the uh, son of John Adams, one of the, the founders of the country. John Quincy Adams uh, was failing in his health, and Daniel Webster, a friend of his, came and described the last meeting that he had with Adams, with, with John Quincy Adams. And he said, someone, a friend of his, came in and made a particular inquiry as to Adam's health. John Quincy Adams answered, he said, I inhabit a weak, frail, decayed tenement, or apartment, battered with, by the winds and broken up by the storms, and from all I can learn, the landlord does not intend to repair. In other words, he said, I'm going to die. I know that I'm going to die. We find that the people that came to the tomb this early on this resurrection morning, these three women that came, First of all, I want us to notice in letter A here that they had seen him die. They had seen him die. Now, we'd have to back up to verses 46 and 47 of the previous chapter. I'm going to read them to you. And the Bible records, it says, And he brought fine linen and took him down and wrapped him in linen and laid him in the sepulcher, which is hewn out of rock, and rolled a stone unto the door of the sepulcher. This is Joseph of Arimathea and Nicodemus who were doing this. It says, and Mary Magdalene and Mary, the mother of Joseph, beheld where he was laid. They were there from start to finish, from the moment that he was taken before Caiaphas and taken into the Sanhedrin, and then was also taken before Pilate to the time when he walked out and he went to Golgotha. They watched him as he was beaten, as he was scourged, as his beard was plucked out, as he was spit upon, as a crown of thorns was laced upon his head. And the one-mile walk that went from, from the Pilate's Judgment Hall to the hilltop of Golgotha, carrying his own cross, these women had watched and observed all this. Not only this, but they watched when he finally got to Golgotha as they laid him out upon the cross that he had carried, and they took heavy spikes and put them into his hands or his wrists and put them into his feet 
and nailed him to the cross. And then with the male factor or a thief and robbers on either side, the three of them, all of them were then stood up into the post. And Jesus Christ, the Son of God, for six hours was upon that cross, suffering. Now, you may not know a lot here about crucifixion, but Jesus Christ, once again, had been beaten and everything before he got there with a cat of nine tails. He had been beaten with fists and rods and spit upon and more, and he had great blood loss at this point. But for six hours, he lingers upon the cross. These women watching and looking on at his feet, weeping over Jesus' death. Literally, someone who was crucified would either die of one of two things, either number one, of blood loss, or number two, they would die of asphyxiation. They would literally not be able to catch their breath anymore. Someone who was crucified would, on the nails that were in their feet, would push up to catch a breath. And then, of course, would not be able to hold it and would sag down, and the pressure on their lungs literally would cause them to suffocate. Many times on their own uh, blood and uh, liquids inside their body that were getting into their lungs. So oftentimes it was a, it was a very cruel and, and harsh kind of death that Jesus Christ would die. But for six hours he hangs upon the cross. I'd even point this out too because we say in here that they saw him die. There were experts at crucifixion that were there. Maybe you didn't realize this. There were experts in crucifixion that were there. They were the Roman soldiers, the centurion that was putting them to death. This was a uniquely Roman form of death and a great, great punishment. A, something that, uh, that said curses a man who hangs on the tree. Something that, that nobody wanted this to ever happen to them or their loved ones. And the experts, you recall, you recall after the great earthquake and the, the shaking of the ground, Jesus Christ gives up his spirit, man did not take him from it. He gave it up freely for us. But as Jesus hangs there, dead upon the cross, the two malefactors that were on either side, the criminals who were on either side of them, were still alive. And so the Roman soldiers came, and oftentimes what they would do is take a spear or a, a rod, and they would break the legs. They'd put them between the legs, and they would break their legs, causing them, once again, not to be able to get up upon their legs to get breath. And literally, then they would suffocate and die in a matter of moments. But the Bible records when they came to Jesus, they were going to break his legs, but they realized that he was already dead. And once again, remember, these are experts. These are people that have done this multiple times. They know whether someone is alive or someone's dead. A centurion, uh, one of the soldiers comes and takes his spear and thrusts it into the side of Jesus Christ, literally puncturing the lung as well as the heart. And the Bible says that blood and water came gushing out. He truly was dead. They had watched him die. But let her be, these women also had come on this resurrection morning to show respect and love. They had come to show respect and love. Mark chapter 16, verse number 1, notice why they come. It says, when the Sabbath was passed, Mary Magdalene and Mary, the mother of Jesus, and Salome, who had brought sweet spices, that they might come and anoint him. When Jesus was laid into the tomb before that Sabbath day that, that was coming place, and before that evening broke, they had hurriedly wrapped him up and put some spices on him and put him in the tomb and rolled the stone upon it. But it was not nearly the kind of love and devotion that they wanted to shower upon him. But because they would be unclean with touching a dead body, going into the Sabbath, being God-honoring Jewish people, they knew that they could not do that. So they rushly, uh, in, a, in a rush and a hurry, put him into the tomb. But now here on this, this resurrection morning, they come ready to do the, the proper benevolence, the proper respect that Jews owed the Lord Jesus Christ. And so they come here once again, not simply because they're believing what Jesus said. They're coming to anoint, once again, a dead body. Let her see they had a reasonable and common expectation. A reasonable and common expectation. You say, what is that? They expected the body to still be dead is what they expected. Now, once again, we can kind of smile at that. You say, well, it's pretty redundant or, or ridiculous type question or statement to make. I've had, over the years of 30 years of being a pastor, I've done many funerals. I've done some recently here. Of course, uh, those know that uh, I buried uh, my mother here, uh, or birth mother, uh, most recently. 
uh, but I have my brother Kyle who also passed away just a few weeks ago. And uh, I'm sure in the near future here, I'll be doing other funerals as well. And generally speaking, when you go to the funeral and you have the viewing and eventually you take that body, you go, you go to the funeral home or to the church, wherever the body is in state, you expect when you get there that the body will still be dead. And if you were to come back three days later, you would not expect that to somehow have reversed itself. You'd expect, once again, that it remains the same. I was reading, of course, with all the uh, coronavirus things that were going on, and uh, one of the totals came across that, uh, that um, uh, there was so and so number of deaths in the United States, and it was one less than it was just a few hours before. And down in the little bit of writing, it said Puerto Rico has retracted one of its deaths. And I found that kind of sadly, darkly humorous that I thought, how can you retract a death? Did you think he was dead and then decided he wasn't? Uh, did you miscount or I don't know what happened there, but I promise you this, I can promise you this, that that person wasn't completely dead and gone for three days and then came back to life. This once again is what's taking place here to these three women who came to show their love and respect to Jesus Christ. But notice also here that when they came to find the, the dead body, they also, number two, they found that the work was already done. The work was already done. Letter A here, there was a great need when they got there. They were thinking about this as they're traveling there, the great need that they have. And verses 3 and 4, it says, And they said among themselves, Who shall roll us away the stone from the door of the sepulcher? Who, who's going to do it? These three women, uh, I doubt were bodybuilders. I don't think they were, they were uh, Amazon women. They were just normal women, uh, normal people like even you and I would be. Uh, that they have an honest question. Who's going to be able to roll this great stone away? Because we find that when they looked, they saw that the stone was rolled away for it was very great. Not just great. It was very great. Uh, this stone, they, when they put it on on Friday, they recognized that they themselves weren't going to be able to push it off, but they were only three of them that were there and they began to talk. How are we going to be able to get into the body with this great stone rolled upon it? These three women could not move it. Well, number one here, the stone was great. Number two, the three women could not move it. It was an impossibility for them to do this themselves. There's a great need. But also we find the letter B, there was a supernatural sight. There was a supernatural sight that greeted them when they got there, wasn't there? You see, God took care of all of it for them. They didn't have to do it. God took care of it. God also provided a witness. The Lord provided a witness here. In verses 5 through 7, it says, And entering into the sepulcher, they saw a young man sitting on the right side, clothed in a long white garment, and they were affrighted. And he said unto them, Be not affrighted. Ye seek Jesus of Nazareth, which was crucified. He is risen. He is not here. Behold the place where they laid him. But go your way and tell his disciples and Peter that he goeth before you into Galilee. There shall ye see him, as he said unto you. This witness is a, is a person, uh, uh, an angel, who Christ is not there. He is risen and gone. But this angel is there to give them testimony to exactly what had taken place, to what had happened. A supernatural sight. The great stone is rolled away, and this angel is sitting there. Now, the three, three women didn't know what had taken place in the middle of that night as Jesus came up out of the tomb. As there was a great earthquake, and the, the angels came and rolled that stone away, and the guards themselves were so scared that the Bible says that they fell back as dead men. They laid there and pretended to be dead. These hardened Roman soldiers, these, these uh, soldiers of the high priest are sitting there and just frozen. And they're pretending they're dead and hoping that something bad doesn't happen to them. But they had no way of knowing all that had taken place in the middle of the night. Say, so what are you trying to say, Pastor? The lesson I think we can take from that is simply this. In the work of salvation, in the work of the gospel... There's a great need that each and every one of us carry. There's a great need that we carry. You see, we are all sinners. The Bible says, for God so loved the world, the world, that he gave his only begotten son. Romans chapter 3, verse number 10 says, as is written, there is none righteous, no, not one. There is none that understandeth, there is none that seeketh after God. Why? Because we are all sinners. For all have sinned. And come short of the glory of God. It's a great need that all of mankind carries. 
Every child is born into this world is not born in as a Christian. They're born in as a sinner in need of a Savior. All of us, no matter how rich we are, how poor we are, no matter what our station in life, no matter what our expectations may be, we are all born sinners. We have the same great need, a need that we cannot accomplish ourselves, just like those women could not roll that stone away from the door by themselves. But God will provide a way. Amen. Think about that. God will provide a way. And God himself provided that that stone would be rolled away and Jesus would come up out of that grave supernaturally, accomplishing that which he had promised and that which he had said. You see, you and I cannot save ourselves. It's an impossibility. Only Jesus Christ alone, his blood, can wash away our sin and give us salvation. There's a man by the name of Pastor Alfred Hackney. Mr. Hackney was an evangelist, but also a songwriter. Mr. Ackley was at one of his evangelistic meetings, and he was confronted afterwards by a Jewish young man who asked him a simple question. He says, why should I worship a dead Jew? Why should I worship a dead Jew? And he tried to talk to the young man and explain to him what was going on and why he should believe in Jesus Christ as a Messiah, but the young man wouldn't hear it, and it bothered him. And so Mr. Ackley began to just think over and over and over in his mind, and it was during that Passion Week that that question was asked. And Sunday morning, he got up and he flipped on the radio to listen to an, uh, a, a, a preacher on the radio, and this liberal preacher said this about the resurrection. Mr. Ackley, as he turned it on, this is what this liberal preacher said. He said, you know, it really doesn't matter to me if Christ be risen or not. His body could have turned to dust long time ago in some Palestinian tomb. But what's important is that his truth goes marching on. When Mr. Ackley, Pastor Ackley heard that, he yelled at the, mic, at, the, at, the, at the radio. He said, that's a lie. And he was so worked up over it that he went... Uh, on with his thoughts as he prepared for the message and he thought he lives i tell you he is not dead but lives here and now jesus christ is more alive today than ever before and i can prove that by my own experience and by my own testimony and the testimony of thousands still after the message he couldn't get that thought out of his mind and that night while he could not sleep he got up and with pen and paper he wrote this hymn he said, I serve a risen Savior. He's in the world today. I know that he is living, whatever man may say. I see his hand of mercy. I hear his voice of cheer. And just the time I need him, he's always near. He lives. He lives. Christ Jesus lives today. He walks with me and talks with me along life's narrow way. He lives, he lives, salvation to impart. You ask me how I know he lives, he lives within my heart. Those of us that are believers, those of us that know Jesus Christ as our Savior, we are not going to heaven because we're perfect people. We are not going to heaven because we have accomplished something great or because we're doing so many good deeds in our community and to those around us. We are saved because we are sinners who heard the gospel of Jesus Christ, that the shed blood of Jesus Christ can wash away our sins, and because of that, we receive Jesus Christ as the only gift that could be given in, ex in exchange for the, the weight of my sin. And Jesus Christ saves us now and forever. As I close today, I want to just leave us with two parting thoughts. Number one, we have a great message to tell. In this time of the coronavirus, and there's so much uncertainty and fear, don't buy into that, Christian. Don't buy into that. I don't care what the, the models say and what everything else says. Don't buy into that. We have a hope in Jesus Christ. If I were to somehow contract this virus, it's okay. Why? Because to be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord. And as the Bible says, which is far better. So why worry? Why be afraid? I also believe in this great message that we have to tell that our Savior does live. Our Savior lives. Think about this. We're not talking about just a religion. We're talking about a relationship. 
We're talking about a risen Savior who sits on the right hand of the throne of the Father, ever ready to welcome any sinner who comes to him and asks for forgiveness and asks for salvation. He is ready to impart that salvation to them if they'll but ask him. Mankind has been redeemed. Salvation is for all. And that which, as these women did, they could not do themselves. God himself has provided a way and a place and a plan for every child of God and for every person who wants to come into God's family if they'll simply recognize they're a sinner. They'll recognize that they are lost. They cannot save themselves. Let me just say something right here. If you could get saved by joining a church, if you could get saved and know heaven is your home by simply being a good person or by doing a, following a certain religion, then Jesus Christ did not need to die. It would just be up to us to do whatever it is that was necessary. But the reality is, no matter how hard we work, we can never get to heaven on our own. Romans 6.23 says this, But the wages of sin is death. The wages of sin is death. There is no escaping this. We are all bound by these chains of sin and death says, but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. I started out quoting John 3, 16. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. Notice this next part. That whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. Today, this Resurrection Sunday, whether you've been in church all your life or this is the very first church service you've ever watched or been a part of, right now today, the Holy Spirit of God is working in your heart and the Son of God in heaven is saying, Come unto me, all ye that are weary and heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Oh, Jesus is waiting for you to come home. He's waiting for you simply to stop trying to work your way to heaven. He's waiting for us to stop being skeptics and doubters and stop being afraid and simply realize that the plan of salvation is free for all mankind if we're willing to reach out and take it. Don't go one more day. Please, please, please do not go one more day and not know Jesus Christ is your Savior. He loves you so much he died on the cross to pay for your sins and mine. But we must accept that gift. The Bible says in Romans chapter 10, verse number 9, that if thou shalt confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus and shalt believe in thine heart that God hath, what? Raised him from the dead. Resurrection day. Raised him from the dead. Thou shalt be saved. Not maybe, not hopefully, not could be. Shall be saved. It's a positive. It's an absolute. If we'll but ask him for salvation. And I'd say to us that are Christians today, those that know Jesus Christ as their Savior, I would say this to us, Mark chapter 16, verses 14 and 15, Jesus, when he finally does speak to the disciples in Galilee, this is what he says to them. He says, Afterward, he appeared unto the eleven as they sat at meat and upbraided them for their unbelief and hardness of heart, because they believed not them which had seen him after he was risen. And he said unto them, Go ye into the, all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. Christian, child of God, we can't just sit back and say, Well, I guess I'm saved, so that's good enough. There are thousands and thousands and millions upon millions in this world today that have never one time heard the message of the gospel or they've heard a corrupted version of the gospel and, realize, and they think they can work their way to heaven or think somehow it's just by a miracle or a happenstance that they might make it rather than realizing that none of us deserve it, that we need to accept Jesus Christ as our personal Savior. Will you do your part? Will I do my part to reach the world with the message of Jesus Christ? He is not here. He is risen. He is risen. Let us truly believe that from our heart today. I'd like us to just take a moment and have a word of prayer. But maybe as you're sitting there today, you'd have to say, Pastor, here in my living room or at my dinner table, where it happens to be that I'm watching this, I don't know Jesus Christ as my Savior. I realize today that I cannot save myself. I'm a sinner. And I need Jesus Christ as my Savior. I would beg of you, once again, beg of you, please. This is not about being a Baptist or a Methodist or a Presbyterian. This is about being a Christian knowing Jesus Christ is your Savior. If you're here today and you don't know Jesus Christ is your Savior, right there where you sit, you can receive Jesus Christ. So how can I do that, Pastor? Well, you must know that you're a sinner. 
You must know that your sin condemns you to a place called hell. You must recognize that Jesus Christ died on the cross for your sins. He was buried and rose again for your salvation. And then most importantly, you must act upon that knowledge and you must cry out in prayer asking Jesus Christ to save your soul. Say, Pastor, I'd like to do that. How can I do that? Very simply by doing this. Right there where you're at, wherever you are right now in the world, stop and pray a simple sinner's prayer like this. Now understand, the prayer doesn't save you. So I'm going to go ahead and give you some words to say, but that prayer doesn't save you. It's no magic prayer. It has to be the belief in your heart behind the words that you're saying. But right now where you're at, you can pray to receive Jesus Christ as Savior by praying a simple prayer like this. Dear Lord Jesus, I know that I'm a sinner. I know I don't deserve heaven. I know I deserve hell. But I ask you now, come into my heart. Take me to heaven when I die. I'm trusting in you and you alone for my salvation. Now, right there at your seat, right there, wherever you're sitting in your living room, your kitchen, your dining room, wherever you are. If you prayed and received Jesus Christ as Savior, God promises to hear that prayer. If you prayed that prayer with belief and with conviction, you become part of God's family, and I congratulate you on that. That's a wonderful comfort and promise to have from the Word of God. Whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. You did that today. I want to encourage you to simply write me a neck, an email or a text. Send it to me on Facebook or on YouTube. Put a little note in there and say, Pastor Crawford, I prayed that prayer this morning. And let me pray for you. Let me reach out to you and try to help you, no matter where you're at in this world, no matter what you've been through. Cross Point Baptist Church is a place where we're focused on pointing men to the cross of Jesus Christ. It doesn't matter who you are, where you are, what you've been, what you've done. We're happy if you receive Jesus Christ as your Savior today. Let's close this part of the service with a word of prayer. Heavenly Father, thank you, Lord, for today. Thank you for your goodness to us. Thank you for the blessing it is to be together on this resurrection day. Truly, Lord, you are not in the grave. Lord, is that liberal preacher said years ago, Lord, it doesn't matter. Oh, it does matter. It's the bedrock of our foundation of our faith. So, Lord, thank you for rising from the dead. Thank you for keeping your word. Thank you for receiving us as your children into the family of God because of salvation. If there be one here today, Lord, that still does not know or unre is unready to receive you as Savior, may today, Lord, before they go to bed tonight, may they just in the quietness of their home, in the quietness of their room, may they call out to you and receive you as Savior. Be with the rest of us as Christians, that we would do our job to share the gospel of Jesus Christ around the world. In thy precious son's name we pray. Amen. I do want to thank you for being here with us today. And I know that this is a, a strange time for us. Um, but as I said, I want you to be encouraged and realize and remember that Jesus Christ is not dead, that he is risen. And so don't walk around with a sad face today. Today, Christians ought to have a smile on their face and know that we serve a risen Savior. He is in this world today. So we're going to go ahead and close the service with a, a song here in just a moment. Have my daughter come up and, and sing with me again. Chris, if I can get you to, there we go. Go to Growing in Grace and we'll sing this song and then we'll be dismissed. We're thankful and grateful for that which we've been able to do here today. Hope you enjoyed this special music. And once all this uh, crisis and nonsense goes behind us, if you live here in the area, I hope that you would come and spend some time with us as a church and let us know uh, how the Lord's working in your life and let us as a church show you the love of Christ in return. So let's go ahead and sing this song. It's our theme song for this year, Growing in Grace. Great reminder today.
God bless you. We love you. We're so thankful for you. If you live here in the community, if we can be of a help to you or do you have any needs, whether it be food-wise or staple goods or just somebody to pray with you and talk to you, feel free to reach out to us. We love being here in the city of Wyoming. We're thankful for the community God has given to us. Those that are Cross Point members, your pastor and his family prays for you. I've reached out to most of you this week or last week. Uh, we love you. We miss you. Looking forward to anything we can do uh, to get us back together again as soon as possible. Thank you for spending time with us today. God bless. Have a great Resurrection Day. And uh, stay safe and stay healthy. God bless.